Let us join together in repeating what we have on the screen. Together now. I am created in the likeness and image of God. Therefore, whatever God is, I am. And this is the truth about me. I use a variety of sources to come up with what I'm going to speak about each week. And I read until something hits me. And uh, the Bible is always one that I always go back to. And uh, so I was reading in it and came up with, of course, I have to come up with a sermon title by Tuesday to give it to uh, Donna France so she can get it in the newspaper. And you notice ours wasn't in the newspaper. Two or three were left out this week for some reason. I'm sure it's there on the paper's part. But... Um, when I was going over this again, I said, huh, this topic is really should have been for next week and not this week. So I had to redo everything to fit it for this week using the title that I had. But since it didn't appear in the paper, y'all probably wouldn't have known the difference anyhow. This is taken basically from John chapter 7, where Jesus was teaching in the temple. And there was a whole lot going on in the temple, as there always was. And it was a busy day for Jesus for teaching. And as usual, most of the time, he was talking to doubters. And by this time, in this chapter 7, there were several that were wanting to kill him. In this day, there was condemnation, plenty of judgment, a little belief about some of them them in the crowd, a lot of truth teachings by Jesus, murder was discussed, and even demons, as all these were topics for discussion. In the Bible, there are a lot of stories about the many ways that the Jews and the elders and the scribes and the Pharisees tried to test Jesus about his beliefs about their scripture. Remember that Jesus said to a come that he had come not to abolish but to fulfill the scripture. He did this by reinterpreting in some cases or in other cases correctly interpreting for the people the meaning that was contained in their scriptures. In John chapter 7 he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum and after this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He did not wish to go to Judea because the Jews were looking for an opportunity to kill him as they saw him as a threat to their thought process, their interpretation of the scriptures. Back then, and I think today too, one of the easiest ways to get rid of your opposition is to kill them, either figuratively or literally. Of course, with political season going on, we can see murder everywhere. Uh, <clears throat> now, the Jewish festival of booths was near. So his brothers, Jesus' brothers, said to him, Leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. Remember, they didn't really believe what he said, but at one point Jesus says, well, if you don't even believe what I've said, at least believe the works that I do so that they can see the works that you are doing. For no one who wants to be widely known acts in secret. If you do these things, these are his brothers advising him now, show yourself to the world. For at that time, not even Jesus' brothers believed him. They didn't believe what he was teaching. So Jesus said to them, My time has not come yet, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify against it that, it, that its works are evil. Go to the festival yourselves. I'm not going to the festival, he tells them. So they took off going to the festival. 
And after saying this, he remained in Galilee. You'll notice a pattern in a lot of what Jesus does. He teaches, he mingles with the crowd, then he goes off by himself for renewal, for meditation. In chapter, in uh, verse 10, it goes on in chapter 7. But after his brothers had gone to the festival, then he went also, not publicly, but as it were in secret. He didn't want people to know that he was there. Because the Jews were looking for him at the festival and saying, Where is he? And there was considerable complaining about him among the crowds. And a few were saying, He's a good man. Others were saying, No, he's deceiving the crowd. Put ourselves in the place of the crowd. Let's say that we're the crowd. Yet no one would speak openly about him for fear of the Jews, for they were always trying to find out who his followers were and who had been listening to him because they were plotting to get rid of him because he was a threat to them. At about the middle of the festival, Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach. The Jews were astonished at it, saying, How does this man have such learning when he has never been taught? This was a common understanding of the religious leaders at the time, for only they had been taught and only they were the ones that were supposed to have any knowledge or understanding at all. Jesus heard this and he answered them, saying, My teaching is not mine but his who sent me. In other words, he was teaching what God had sent to him. Anyone who resolves to do the will of God will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own. Those who speak on their own seek their own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true. And there is nothing false in him. Today, it's amazing to me that how of all the different organized religions we have, and yet none of them really teach their true religion or from their true religious understanding. We all practice a distorted version thereof. Some ask, it says, or Jesus said rather, did not Moses give you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Why are you looking for an opportunity to kill me? They wanted to destroy the opposition. This was contrary to their belief system. The crowd answered, says, you have a demon. Of course, if you're talking truth teaching, still true today, they're going to think you're crazy. Those of us that study a course have heard that over and over. Who is trying to kill you? they ask. Jesus answered them this way. He said, I performed one work on a Sabbath and all of you are astonished. Are you angry with me because I, I healed a man's whole body on the Sabbath? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Because in their law, you know, you couldn't work or do healings on a, on a Saturday, Sunday. Now some of the people of Jerusalem, it goes on in verse 25, is not this the man whom they are trying to kill? Look at the questioning that's going on in the minds of the people during this time. And here he is, they said, speaking openly, but they say nothing to him? Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Messiah? Yet we know where this man is from, they knew he was from the hometown boy from down the road. But when the Messiah comes, no one will know where he is from. Then Jesus cried out as he was teaching in the temple. Now this word, Jesus cried out, is in here a lot. Well, 
remember back, you're in the middle of a huge temple. There's no microphones. There's no sound system. So to be heard over the crowd, you've got to cry out or holler out. So he hollered out, you know me and you know where I am from. They knew his story as a child and where he came from. I have not come on my own, but the one who sent me is true, and you don't know him. He was talking about his father. I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. Then that was enough. They tried to arrest him. But no one laid hands on him because his hour had not yet come. This hour had not yet come is repeated in chapter 7 and 8 a lot. To fulfill the scriptures, it was prophesied as to the coming of Jesus and how and the time in which he would, would be crucified. So his hour had not come yet. So no one laid hands on him. Yet many in the crowd believed in him and were saying, listen to this, when the Messiah, and I'm going to add some words, does come, will he, he will do more signs than this man has done. So they knew Jesus was just the boy down the road, but when the true Messiah comes, he'll do all kinds of things. They didn't understand. As you've heard me say, I don't think that we have even begun to study the teachings of Jesus yet ourselves in this day and age. The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering such things about him, and the chief priests and Pharisees sent temple police to arrest him. Jesus then said, I will be with you a little while longer, and then I am going to him who sent me. You will search for me, but you will not find me. For where I am, you cannot come. Well, this threw them a curveball. They had no idea what he meant there. The Jews were talking among themselves and said to one another, Where does this man intend to go? They were thinking only physically, not metaphysically. Metaphysically, metaphysics simply means can't be proven with physics. Where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? In other words, he's going to leave the whole territory and go teach the Greeks. What does he mean by saying, you will search for me and you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come? We can't enter the kingdom of heaven with the physical thought process. We can only enter through the revelation of, of the teachings of the spiritual thought process. We don't know. They just were perplexed. And what does this mean when he said that? On the last day of the festival, the great day, while Jesus was standing there, he again cried out, because he didn't have a microphone, that anyone who is thirsty come to me. And let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now again, he mentions the scripture that out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. He was fulfilling and interpreting that scripture because whoever, the one who believes in me will drink Drink of the living water. In other words, take in. What do we do when we physically drink? We take in. We ingest. So that's what he's wanting to do is to take in and ingest his teachings so they would be aware. But as the Bible plainly says, you can never under things, understand things of the spirit with the physical thought process. Physical mind, it says in the Bible. So now he said this about the spirit which believers in him were, were to receive. Again, to fulfill scripture, the spirit, as it says here, for as yet there was no spirit because Jesus was not yet glorified. The spirit was to descend upon us and be left with us. You remember prior to 
Jesus leaving us, he said, The Father will not leave you comfortless, for he will send to you the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, who will remind you of everything that I have said and to teach you all things whatsoever. He said that later than this time period here. Also, that was to fulfill the Scripture. Now, when we talk about Scripture, we're talking about Old Testament Jewish teachings to us. When they heard these words, some in the crowd said, This is really the prophet. Others said, This is the Messiah. But some asked, Surely the Messiah does not come from Galilee, does he? Has not the scripture said that the Messiah is, is descended from David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David lived? So there was much division, the Bible says, in the crowd because of him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. Then the temple police went back to the chief priests and Pharisees who asked the police, why did you not arrest him? There he was right there with you. The police answered, never has anyone spoken like this. Well, that really bothered the elders more than ever. Then the Pharisees replied, surely you have not been deceived too, have you? Has any one of the authorities or of the Pharisees believed in him? They were wanting to know. From the police. But this crowd which does not know the law, they are accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus before and who was one of them, asked, Our law does not judge people without first giving them a hearing to find out what they are doing, doesn't it? He was asking the rest of the elders. They replied, Surely you are not also from Galilee, are you? Search and you will see that no prophet is to arise from Galilee. And the discussion continued. The argument back and forth as to where he came from, who Jesus really was. Chapter 7 ends right there. But you turn the page to chapter 8. And 8.1 says this. It's the continuation of this discussion. While they were having this discussion, it says, while Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. I love the transition. Here the argument is going on. In the meantime, Jesus goes to the Mount of Olives. He walked out of there. He went to his place of solitude. He went to where he could find his renewal where he could commune. What an example for us if we're willing to understand this and see it. We can divorce ourselves and remove ourselves from the controversy and the arguing back and forth that's going on in the temple and among the authorities at hand. While Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, I love that verse. We can all go to our Mount of Olives. Like Mara said in her meditation, we can return to that library at any time we want. We can reread the ending at any time we want. We all have a place of solitude and a place for renewal. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks. For everything that we have is a free gift from you. We thank you for the teachings of our brother that we call Jesus. We thank you for him continually speaking to us in this day and this age. For he told us and reminded us several times that he would never leave us. He would be with us always, even until the end of the age. And for this, we're eternally grateful. Amen. 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 Amen.
Amen.